Hi guys, Squirrel here and welcome to another Derail Valley Simulator video. In this video, we are going to look at the two diesel electric locomotives available in Derail Valley Sim. This on the right, the yellow one, this is the DE2. This is a two axle diesel electric locomotive. And then over here, the big boy, the DE6, the six axle diesel electric locomotive. Now they both operate in a similar way. They generate power in a similar way and put that power down in a similar way. So I thought them cover them both in the same video. So we shall go through startup, shutdown, how to operate them, and the big differences between how they work in Derail Valley Simulator versus Derail Valley Overhaul. So let's get started. So let's start off by looking at the DE2. Now, the DE2 should, because obviously you left it this way, have its handbrake on. The DE2 has a handbrake on the inside of the cabin. And if you want to release the brakes using the auxiliary lever, as we talked about in the last braking video, it's here, just under the cab. You can't really see it unless you put your, your light on it or if the lighting's just right, but there it is. So let's jump inside the cab. So the handbrake is actually here at the back. You know, you can walk through the door like this if you want to. Handbrake is here, so make sure that's on before you uh, start the engine up. Especially on a slope, because you don't want it rolling away. Now, this is the main kind of circuit board here, and the main thing you need to turn on is obviously the electrics, which will then activate the traction motor offline warning, which basically means that this breaker's down. So the traction motor breaker goes up, and then you'll need the starter breaker before you can activate the start lever. Just spin the mouse wheel when you look at it, or you can press the Alt key, move it around like this and activate it that way. Or even depending on your difficulty settings, when you press the Alt key and you've got this interface here, you can even just activate the electrics down here and hold the starter switch down there. So there are a few ways of doing this, but I'm just gonna show you the physical way of doing it. Having done that, you can, if you want to, deactivate the starter breaker, but it really doesn't matter. And then the other two that you've got are down here. This is the dash lighting, which lights the display up, which you will need at night. And the other one is the cab light, which is overhead. I also suggest that you carry with you uh, your lantern, which you'll need to light. And uh, it, it's quite handy to just have it in here at night because it can get very dark and it will just help with general illumination. Okay, so having done that, the next thing that you'll want to do is to turn on your front and rear lights. So for normal operation, you want to spin the mouse wheel and turn it clockwise, which will put the front single light on, and again, we'll put the main lights on, and then there's a high beam. For the rear, you want to turn it counterclockwise so you get the red lights, and you can operate those as well if you want to, if you're if you're reversing in the yard. It will, generally speaking, when you reverse, uh, it will operate those lights for you anyway. Uh, when you do this kind of thing, it will automatically put the lights on again, depending on your difficulty setting. And there's the wipers if you need them. The cab fan does absolutely nothing. It's not a cooler, it's not a radiator. It's meant to operate this for the driver, but currently doesn't do anything. The other things to note are the sander, which is here, should you need it for climbing up a slippy uh, gradient. And then there's the fuel cutoff, which if you activate, is the new way of stopping the locomotive. Previously, you had to go to this panel here, but now you have to use the fuel cutoff. Now, before we get started, a little bit of theory about how these locomotives are putting their power down and generating it. So no doubt you'll have worked out we have a diesel engine in here, but that is not something that you directly control. The diesel engine is actually governed by a management system. And when you activate the throttle, what it actually does is determine how much power you want to put through the traction motors. The traction motors normally sit one on each axle down here, and the traction motors are basically electric motors. There's a generator attached to the diesel engine. So as the diesel engine spins quicker, it turns the generator that generates more power, and more current, which is fed down to the traction motors, which propels the vehicle forward or backwards, depending on what direction you set the reverser. So with that in mind, in Derail Valley Simulator, what you have to watch out for now are, I guess, two things. The first is this, this is the ammeter. This is how much current you are putting through the traction motors. And the other dial, which is important, is this one. This is 
the TM temp, the traction motor temperature. That's how hot the traction motor is getting. So when you're in a climb, you'll need to make sure you keep this power meter under control so you're not putting too much power through it and also making sure that your temperature on your traction motors is not getting too high. Now, without getting too technical, the faster that the traction motors spin, or rather, you know, the faster the wheels spin, the more back EMF or counter electromotive force that is generated. And this counter voltage lowers the current flowing through the traction motors. And you'll see this as we demonstrate shortly. Now, what does that mean practically? Practically speaking, what that means is that heat will most easily be generated at lower speeds. And you'll have to manage this, especially during climbing. It's critical that you apply power gently, notch by notch, and keep the current at a nominal level. Momentum and a run up at a hill will have a big effect on your locomotive is able to actually haul cargo up a hill before it overheats the traction motors. So let's jump inside the cab and uh, we'll demonstrate, whoops, we'll demonstrate a uh, couple of things here. Let's just shut the door there. Let's put the reverser into its forward position. Now, previously in DE2, before we do this, that flashing symbol, by the way, is, depending on your difficulty level, reminding you, basically, that it's a braking problem. Either there's no pressure on the line because a, a valve is open somewhere, or usually you've left the handbrake on. So if you see a flashing symbol, don't try moving. Now, in DE2, it was quite common in sorry, Deer Valley Simulator, it was quite common in a DE2 to drive forward and then you could switch the reverser back like that and put the power down and that would help you by applying power in the opposite direction to slow you down. You can't do that in Deer Valley Simulator and I'll show you why. If we release the brakes and what we'll do is we'll bring in some forward throttle here Notice immediately that we get a very high amperage, which as the vehicle starts to speed up, drops away. That's the back EMF disappearing. I'll go to neutral. I will activate the throttle in the reverse direction and we'll put some power down and watch what happens to the ammeter. Okay. <laughs> That all happened very, very quickly. What actually happened? Well, first of all, we'll stop this noise by popping the breaker back on the traction motors. So we've just caused some damage is what's just happened. But you'll notice that when you try to drive in one direction and then operate the traction, meters, traction motors in the other, the currents shot up massively and the temperature very quickly climbed up into the red. And when it was in the red for too long, the traction motor had a problem overcurrented and it popped the breaker which is that though which is the warning that you get we have caused some damage and we'll have to go and get this repaired popping the breaker is the best outcome if you do it too much you'll actually cause a short circuit and you can potentially set fire to the whole thing let's reverse this back into the repair yard because i want to show you how that works now now the traction motor gauge shows the average temperature of the traction motors Depending on how many you have, it doesn't really matter. It's an average temperature. And it is okay to be in the yellow on the amps. It just will cause the temperature to rise much quicker. But if you do get into the red zone on the temperature, it won't be long, as you saw before the uh, traction motors. The breaker actually pops or something even worse. I think we've stopped in the right place. Okay, so let's go and have a look at what actually happened. Electrical powertrain. Now, current is a unfortunate term, but what it means is the current percentage. So the electrical powertrain has been damaged by, what, 7%? And we can actually repair that on its own if we want to, like that. So that costs us whatever many dollars that turns out to be. I think I'm in sandbox mode. Obviously, it also caused some damage to the mechanical powertrain, which is interesting because when the whole thing blew, it actually caused some damage within the uh, generator system as well as the traction motors and obviously you've got oil sand and diesel now diesel is a curious one because this has changed you now have to click it and pick it up and pop it on like that before you can actually apply some diesel 
which is quite a cool thing. They actually got that idea from Meister Macabre. I really like it. <laughs> so anyway, this is all repaired up now. So let's take a look at what it's like just to haul some stuff. So here we are, the D2. We've got four cars filled with cows, pretty heavy cows by the look of it. Now, the D2 in Dero Valley Simulator has a radiator on the front, much like it did in Overhauled, and that still has an effect in that if you're going forward, you'll get better cooling than if you're reversing. This is a shunter mostly, don't forget, but it is still pretty effective. The other thing to note is that in Dero Valley Overhauled, this thing would wheel slip something crazy when it was starting out. That's no longer the case. They've fixed all that. It behaves a lot more realistically, and the traction is much easier to put down. But we do have to watch out for our amps and our temps. So let's give it a whirl. So we start off by bringing in one notch of power. Now see the temperature is starting to rise pretty rapidly. We're in the yellow zone on the current, but as we start to move forward, the current will start to back off and the climb in temperature will also start to back off as well. So now you need to make a decision. Do you go for more current or not? Well, we've got a hill to climb. We need to get some momentum going. So I'll bring in one more notch of power. And I'm trying to build some speed for the hill climb, but I'm equally aware that we've got a lot of temperature going on right now. This is something that is, you know, you have to do this to get the eye, to get the sort of feel for what to do. In Dira Valley Overhaul, this was a different proposition to in Simulator. But if I overheat those traction motors, I'm going to have to back off and then we're looking at a hill start. And a hill start is not an easy thing to do in a train full of stuff. So right now, I'm just keeping the whole thing at a constant throttle. Our temperature is now holding. But notice the current starting to rise because we're starting to slow down. So I'm going to have to bring in some more power, risk some more temperature. And indeed, this is where you find out if your locomotive can handle it or not. Right now, there's nothing you can do but sit and watch and just hope that this thing makes it. If it doesn't, your best bet is to go back down to the harbour and take a bigger run up at this hill to get it over the top because we've still got quite a bit of climb left. In the old DE2, the temperature would still be climbing up right now because the engine's working. In the new DE2, in this Dero Valley simulator, what's actually happening is the temperature is remaining pretty consistent. The engine is being cooled pretty consistently and the traction motors are not overheating because the current is flowing through it but not overheating them. They're getting some passive cooling as we move through the atmosphere. So at this point, the gradient is obviously starting to change a little bit. The, the main thing is the speed and the temperature. But this, at the moment, looks like it's under control. If you had a couple more cars on the back, I would suggest that we'd need probably a bigger run-up to make it. But this is quite manageable uh, for the DE2 coming out of the harbour. So what we'll do now is we'll jump into a DE6 and we'll take a look at how we go down a hill and use the dynamic brake. What you have to bear in mind about the DE2 is it does not have a dynamic brake. When you're going down a hill, you have no choice but to use the brakes that are available. Now the tr traction motor temperature as we reach this plateau is just about getting ready to go red. So I'm just gonna bring one notch back on the power just to stop the, the um, overheating from happening. We don't wanna go into the red zone, but hopefully you can see that we have just, just made it onto the plateau. So what we would have to do right now is back off on the throttle, let those traction motors cool down because we've got another hill coming up. So we just use this time to let things cool off before we take another big run up and get the momentum going again. But anyway, let's jump to the D6 and we'll do some downhill braking. All right, so now we're in the DE6. We're just outside of the military base. We've got a load of spent nuclear fuel in the back here. Pretty heavy stuff. Let's jump in and get us started up. The handbrake is on at the moment, so we'll just pop up into the cabin. And the first thing we want to do is look for the electrical panel. It's not here on the DE2. It's actually over uh, this way on, on the DE6. The main one is here, the electric breaker. If you turn that one on, you get a couple of things. First of all, you've now got the 
lighting available so you can see what you're doing. And the second thing is, just like the DE2, you're going to have this traction motor light going off. You need to throw the traction motor uh, breaker, which is this big thing over here. So you throw that up, that engages the electrics of the traction motor. If you manage to pop the breaker, this is the breaker that you'll need to turn on. Additionally, you've got, just like DE2, you've got a starter breaker, but you have to come out here in order to start it up. So you need to mouse wheel and open this panel. Uh, there is actually a pump handle here, but it doesn't appear to do anything right now. It's normally for priming. And then you just hold the starter and off she goes. So that is how you start the DE6 up. Uh, the fuel cutoff, let me just put a lantern down here. Uh, the fuel cutoff is actually down here. If I can just get to it. There's the fuel cutoff, so that's what you press to actually shut the DE6 down and then you turn all the lights and the breakers off, etc. It's principally the same as the DE2, just the things are in a different position. So, you've got the sand gauge here, along with the sand button under there. See how much sand you've got left. Your fuel meter's over here, how much diesel, how much oil. This is where your bell is, your front lights and your rear lights work exactly the same way as the DE2, as does the wiper. At the top, you've got your uh, tachometer, which is showing your engine RPM, which isn't really something to watch out for. It's all managed anyway. There's the traction motor temperature. There's the yellow. There's the red. And then here's the ammeter. Again, same principles as the D2. This is the amps. This is the traction motor temp. When you're looking out the window, which you normally do by pressing the X key just to sit down, speed, amps, temp, they're your key things to look at, which is why they're conveniently located. Your light switches are up here. We've discussed the the braking before. Obviously, we've got the um, handbrake on, so it's flashing at the moment. And then you've got your throttle lever, your reverser, your train brake, your independent brake. So these are all here. And then this is the new one for the DE6 compared to the DE2, the dynamic brake. Now, while we pop outside and actually release the handbrake, let's just make sure we definitely have our um, train brake fully operational. We do just quickly release the handbrake let's talk about roughly or very briefly how a dynamic brake works in this locomotive so because this is a um, a diesel electric locomotive it actually has um, electro rheostatic braking is what it's called there are two types of braking I guess on these kind of vehicles one is a uh, I'm gonna pop on the on the roof by the way one is regenerative braking and the other is what's called uh, rheostatic braking. I'm, tr I'm struggling to get on the roof, guys. I just want to jump up there, but the game won't let me. Let me try going out here. There's a reason why I want to go on the roof. Good grief, this is more hard than it should be, right? There's a reason I want to get on the roof. It's because I want to show you these things. Obviously, you've got a diesel um, engine under here, but you've also got these giant fans. And these fans are pretty important when it comes to cooling especially when it comes to dynamic braking because what happens when you engage the dynamic brake on the DE6 is it effectively turns the traction motors into little portable generators and they will use the momentum of the train to generate electricity where does that electricity go well it doesn't go into batteries that would be regen braking what it actually does is it gets shoved through an awful lot of resistors or rheostats they resist the electric currents but they chuck out a lot of heat that heat has to be thrown away which is what those big fans are on top so when you activate the dynamic brake it slows the train down by using the motors to generate electricity and resist the movement but that heat gets thrown away via the fans up there that's how it works it works differently in the DH and the DM, we'll look. We'll take a look at those in separate videos, but that's how it works on the DE6. So, we're on a slope. It's, uh, it's quite a steep slope. We've got a big weight behind us. We're going to start moving forward, and then we'll activate the dynamic brake, and we'll see what effect it has. It, it has more of an effect at speed, less of an effect at slow speed, so you will seem to use the brakes to actually bring yourself to a, a stop. But what it will do is save you overheating your main brakes, which is a thing in Derail Valley Simulator. So here we are, speed limit is currently posted at 50, we're about to go through a fairly tight turn. 
We're going downhill, so we're starting to uh, slowly build up some speed. The gradient actually increases as we go around this curve here, and you can see already we're picking up a lot of speed. So what do we do? We keep the reverser in the direction that we are traveling. That's very important. We then idle the throttle, and then you bring in the dynamic braking. Now, look at the speed. It's still increasing, so we'll bring in a bit more dynamic braking. We're looking to try and keep the speed limit under control. 40 was the, the uh, signpost. We'll see how much braking we get out of that. That's maximum dynamic. We're still a little bit quick, so at this point I would bring in a bit of locomotive brake just to take the edge off it. There it comes back. It's under control again. We've got a speed limit of 30 coming up. This is where you would decide, do I need to activate my train brake? Is this enough braking? to hit the next bend but at the moment we're only heating up the actual locomotive brake we're not heating anything else up so I'm just going to back off on the loco brake so we've just got dynamic going now speed's increasing a little bit so I'll bring in the train brake one notch Now what this is doing is providing us with quite a lot of braking force that would otherwise cause our brakes to melt. And if you overheat the brakes, and there's no, there's no uh, gauge in here to show brake temperature, but you'll feel it, the brakes will start to fade and you'll pick up speed and there's not a lot you can do about it. As well as the dynamic brake, you have also have another option. You can put a caboose on the back of your train and activate the handbrake on it I mean, obviously you have to jump out and then jump into the back there, but it, it is an option. Just reduce the uh, train brake again. It is an option um, to get some kind of free braking that doesn't overheat your uh, your main loco brakes. So when you finish with your dynamic braking, you can just disengage it and you'll pick up speed again. It's very effective and uh, actually sounds quite cool as well. So that's dynamic braking in the DE6. Now there's just one final thing to note before we sign off. You may well have used the remote control, extremely useful, especially when shunting around the yard. You can of course use the loco with the DE2. In Dira Valley Overhauled, you could also use it with the DE6, not in Deer Rail Valley Simulator, it cannot be paired with the DE6. That changes the game substantially for a DE6 when you're operating it. No longer will you be able to remotely control it. You've got to be inside that cab or using the, the new UI that I've showed or will show in a different video. But hopefully that's given you a very good idea and a grounding in how the DE2 and DE6 operate and how to control them effectively. That's it for this video. Take care, guys. Happy training.